Hi, I'm Ed Scar, and I've just got hold of the Gaunt's Coast character squad. And in this video, I'll be opening it up, having a closer look, and doing a bit of a review. As this was supposed to arrive some time ago, I missed the opportunity of unboxing this on video last weekend, so I've had some extra time to do a proper video this weekend. And I want to particularly thank Just Make Stuff for donating just enough to uh, get me to buy this. It wasn't quite the whole thing, but it was certainly the lion's share. And so there'll be a link to their Instagram page in the description below. But that's enough of that, let's open the box and see what's inside. Lacking my own straight silver, I do have a variety of hobby knives so I can get in. As expected, there's a pack of bases, the destruction manual, and a single sprue for the models. Immediately clear is the quality of the sculpting and moulding. There's one part here that we spotted in pictures of the sprue. I had assumed that it was a basing piece, some hanging vines or something. However, we joked that it was Larkin's toupee. So I found the part, it's number 10, and I looked on the instructions. <laughs> I kid you not, it's, it's Corbeck's toupee. <laughs> that little wisp of hair over his face, that's a separate part. That's amazing. Oh. That's absolutely hilarious. But with the Gaunt's Ghost set, there's at least some effort made to put some of the joins in sensible locations. There is this extra seam across the shoulders with buckles, which are on a separate piece, front and back. This means that if there is a tiny gap when you glue them together, it will just look like a seam in the fabric and it would work in scale without needing any milliput or anything to gap fill. I wanted to do some sub-assembly when painting this set, so we'll see how that affects it. I noticed that all of the torsos are hollow, and you might think I'll go on a rant about how Games Workshop's skimping on the polystyrene, but this is actually part of the thermold calculations, so that the plastic doesn't pull as it shrinks when it cools. But what's a good model if it can't be built? So let's pick a model that I don't already have one of, and get started. McColl seems like an excellent starting point, and I quickly hit on the Games Workshop formula here. Good moulding with easy to remove mould lines and terrible split locations requiring gap filling. The worst part of this model is his straight silver, which is on the cloak piece, which is almost completely recessed behind other parts of the model, but it is still quite visible. Getting in here with a brush would be impossible. However, there is a gap on the shoulder hidden by this tree branch. So milliputting and then reaching it with sandpaper or a file is going to be difficult there. Which means this part is difficult to paint in one piece, and it's difficult to assemble after painting in sub-assemblies. It's almost like the people at Games Workshop aren't hobbyists anymore. McColl's Laughs Gun is in a scabbard, very similar to the Scion Hellguns in scabbard. It's certainly not the same piece though, the folds in the fabric are different, and we have the sculpted wood grain on the stock. Strangely, this part of the front of the cloak is really well separated. It is all cloak and it fits onto the chest which has no cloak. McColl's head is the only option in the set. You can choose from a version with the face visible and the hood held back, or with the hood fully forward. I hadn't noticed this from the pictures before, but the tree branch doesn't actually touch in the middle, only at one edge. Now of course a styrene cement join is plenty strong enough to support this, and it's a really cool look. And there is McColl. Bragg up next with his submachine autocannon. And second magazine on his belt is a nice touch as well. All of these parts slot into place quite nicely. It's certainly not push fit, cement is required here, but they fit together snugly so it's much easier to line everything up. Oddly, his straight silver is a separate piece that sticks out when fully assembled, but still difficult to reach with a brush when it's behind the leg and gun barrel and Bragg has a shouty face. There seems to always be shouty faces in Imperial Guard kits. I usually prefer the kind of stoic or severe expressions, but the odd shouty face is a good fun one to mix in. I did later change my mind about sub-assemblies for Bragg. I originally planned to paint it in two pieces, but after thinking about it, I settled on fully assembling the character, but starting to paint it off of the base to get the inside of the cloak and the back of the legs, and then putting him back on the base for the rest. And there is Bragg. Raw next, and again these parts settle into place really well. But I found a worse seam than on McColl's shoulder. 
Thankfully, this is easy to access with sandpaper, so cleaning this up shouldn't be too hard. But again, it means I have to paint this part of the model fully assembled, and so I'll paint Rawn off of the base rather than in sub-assemblies, which is what I'd prefer to do. When I was finished assembling all of the models, I found this last gun. I thought it was a spare, but actually it should have gone to Rawn. I took the opportunity to compare it to some of the other last gun models that are easily available, and the back end is very familiar, matching both the Cadian and Catachin options, except that the stock has wood grain. The midsection is also replaced with a wood grain section, and interestingly, the overall length is slightly longer than the other types. The main body section is the same length as the Cadian, but the exposed barrel section is the same as the Catachin, leading to a longer overall length. And this might be due to the increase of the size of the models, but I'll discuss that later on. Here is Rawn. Larkin is next, and I think I'll play my live reaction for this one. So the Larkin model, I, I'm genuinely upset with this because not only have we got that horrible join down the side there that's going to need some serious work, the, the straight silver is, like I'm not even convinced that it's visible when the model is assembled. Ah, I, I'm, I just, I just don't know the worst join, so I want to glue that together, but there's no way of fitting any of the other parts in once that's what's this little... Why? Why is this? Why would you do it this way? This is absolutely absurd. Just run the cloak down there and have it end there. <sighs> and so Larkin is built. Well, let's cheer me up with Corbeck who is, like many of the others, easy to paint in one piece if done off of the base. Certainly making me happy is this little fringe piece, those little straggles of hair raised off of his face requiring a separate piece. The separation of the piece isn't great, leaving a gap all across the top of his head, so some filling work needed here. And this is one of the smallest parts of any kit I've built. It's only slightly larger than an individual hand. And there is Corbeck. Last in the set is Lord Militant himself, or as portrayed here with the dual rank Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt. And I've noticed one different mistake here. This on Gaunt's shoulder is a Commissar's epaulette, an important part of the uniform and therefore any Commissar model. It has tassels with rope texture. This is an important fine detail and there is a sprue connection point exactly here, right at the top where it is most visible. And no amount of careful shaving of the sprue will bring back this obliterated texture. It simply isn't there anymore. Well, I carved out one little piece here to create a gap, as if some of the tassels had been torn away, and we'll see how successful that is when I get around to painting it. Otherwise, this model has a great pose and all of the parts fit together well. I'll also be painting this one in one piece off of the base to access the inside of the cloak. And Gaunt is complete. With the set all assembled, I can have a closer look, and they are what most of us would expect from Games Workshop of recent years. Well sculpted and poorly split, although maybe not as poorly split as some of the recent models. The poses are all distinct, fitting all of the characters and look great. Each one is monopose, with no easy way of changing anything without some serious hacking, so the conversion potential is somewhat limited, but that's the price to pay for these really cool poses. Once they're all finished, they will look excellent on the gaming table and on display. I can't think of a single one of my custom ghost models that looks quite as good as these figures, but that's probably a good thing, as these are my character models, they are supposed to look better. So I just need to solve the conundrum of McCall's head. I need to choose between the fully hooded or the partially hooded heads, so maybe to help I can see what the other torsos the heads look good on, so I can use the other head to convert a new ghost model. 
Obviously, I've got a bunch of Cadians knocking about. I'm generally using those for my ghost army. Not bad. A little cutting to get it in the position, and this will look pretty good once the cloak is moulded around it as well. I also have some catechins, which I prefer for the Tanith models, as the poses just generally look a little more appropriate. Although maybe the head doesn't fit this torso quite as well as the Cadian ones. I also still have an officer's torso from the Cadian command set, and a female torso from Frostgrave, and this is the same piece I used to make Anna Kurth. Not quite the right look for McCall's spare head. How about a Stormcast? Well, this looks surprisingly good, and I might actually go for this. Rather than making another ghost, I could make a really stoic Stormcast. I went through my bits box and I found a dwarf's torso. The heads of this kit attach in a strange way, so it doesn't really look that good. Also, orc necks are similar. And a Gretchen? I think it's best to stay at least a little bit humanoid, so how about this elven wild rider torso left over from the Sisters of the Thorn set? Cut away the weird neck and this could work really well. They even come with a cloak waving out back, because this set was meant to be mounted. Well I certainly think the partially hooded head looks better, and so I'll attach that to my McCall model and use the hooded head elsewhere. And I maybe haven't decided exactly what that will be, so we shall see that in the future. Well, now that we've had some fun, let's go back to being very technical and compare the 2021 set to the old Pewter 2002 set. And I can compare the Gaunts, who are both clearly wearing a Commissar's uniform, but almost every detail of that uniform is different. The buttons on the chest, the epaulettes, the sash, and particularly the eagle on the cap. I do prefer the newer pose here. As I mentioned in my old painting video of the Metal Gaunt, the leaning forward pose makes it less interesting to look at on the gaming table, as your opponent sees the top of his head and you only see the cloak. With the new pose, at least your opponent gets the intimidation of seeing the full stature of the character and also the face. Let's just hope I paint the face well. And let's look at the Corbex. And whilst it's sad that the old Corbeck will now be relegated to being just a generic Alaskan trooper, at least I can field it, whereas I've nearly filled out all of the Commissars in the Ghost, and so what do I field the old Gaunt as? Both Corbecks have somewhat of an action-ready pose, viewing the field, staying aware, and not shying back from getting stuck in. I really like both of these poses. They're both excellently sculpted in the different techniques, and I couldn't choose between them. The new and old Larkin models have a more similar pose, although the old Larkin is hunched over a little more, leading to a much smaller model, even outside of the scale difference. I think I prefer the older model here, and not just because of that horrible part splitting. Snipers do a lot more than just shooting, they're always good at infiltration and scouting, and the old model having his head up seems like he's studying the scene, maybe setting up for a shot. While I will be using the new Larks as Larks, the old one will become a valued other sniper. The other three characters from the new set don't have a counterpart from the old set, but I'll still show some comparisons and bring in some other models to talk about size and scale. Many tabletop games have settled on the 28mm hero scale, where a fully grown adult human would be 28mm to the eyes for some reason, or 32mm-ish to the top of the head. And hero scale means they're slightly cartoony, big hands and faces makes it easier to paint, and they also look much more distinct even though they are so small. The older models are a little closer to true scale, with closer to real human proportions, and that's something I really like about them. The Cadian and Catechin models, however, are really very much on the heroic scale, with the Catechin muscle builders and the dumpy Cadians. The new ghosts are somewhere in the middle, and for me, they strike just about the perfect balance. Whilst not accurately proportioned to a human of that size, the differences make them far more, well, heroic. Well-sculpted faces, arms, and poses really sell the whole thing, and all six look great. However, you've probably noticed in this comparison that the heights of the models are also a little bit different. So I took my calipers to them and found that they all stand at roughly 35 millimeters to the top of the head. 
meaning they're between 5 and 10% bigger than both the old models and the Cajuns and Catachins that are available from Games Workshop now. At first I was slightly annoyed by this. I'd rather keep everything in scale together, at least the same height. But once I put them amongst some other models, they don't really look out of scale, they just look tall. And I think the only reason they get away with this is because they are character models. And having the heroes be ever so slightly bigger means they stand out and look all the cooler on the gaming table without being enough to push them out of scale in your head. And just one more thing about the sizes is the bases and the bases are 28 millimeters. To quickly compare them to a properly sized 25 millimeter base and the oversized 32 millimeter monster base, they sit somewhere in between. As the models are 5 to 10% bigger, the bases are 12% bigger, proportionately a tiny bit more space for some fancy basing material, and I'll totally botch that, I'm sure. So before I wrap up, I'll quickly mention the pricing. Counting only the list price on the Games Workshop website. The Metal 2002 set cost £15 for six models. Sculpted by hand and pewter cast is a very time-intensive process in terms of human hours. Inflation from 2002 to 2021 brings that to just over £21. The new set, which is excellently digitally sculpted, but then injection moulded in styrene. The sculpting process requires just as much skill, just a slightly different style, but the moulding process is far more automated mass production process, meaning the overall cost will be less. Add to that the economy of scale, the Games Workshop is now a bigger company than ever, and more popular, these models will certainly sell more than the old ones ever did. You would expect, therefore, that the new set would be less than the adjusted 21 price of the originals, but instead are double that price at £42, which is absurd. Well, I've built the models and I've talked you all to death. I will mention that I will be painting these models in a series of separate videos so that I can spend the time on each one to really get the effect that I want. No speed painting like some of my line infantry. Speaking of my line infantry models, I have a whole playlist of videos about Gaunt's Ghosts models, including various ways of making cloaks, painting, and in some cases just showing off. Of particular interest, you might like my first six videos where I painted the pewter Gaunt's Ghost set. Overall, I think the new models themselves are great. They have characterful poses and proportions. The slightly larger size isn't a detriment in my opinion, just makes them look more noticeable on the field. They assemble well, and although there's a couple of parts that will cause some issues for painting, these are a big improvement over some of the recent models from Games Workshop. There are some parts that might be fragile, the straight silver blades and Corbex fingers, but these are bigger than some other protruding parts of other models, like bayonets and spearheads and that sort of thing, so I don't think that's really a negative point overall. I would say if they were the same adjusted price as the old set, then this would be an excellent purchase. Not just for fans of Gaunt's Ghosts, but any guard player and any model maker who just wants some really badass science fiction forest soldiers. But with the price being double that, I can't recommend it to anyone except the most diehard fans of the book series. And even then, don't buy it directly. Find an independent retailer with a discount. And with all that said, I'll wrap this one up so that I can get to painting. I want to thank again Just Make Stuff for their contribution to ensure that I could get hold of this set for review. Link in the description to their Instagram. Also in the description is a donation link for anyone else to contribute. You don't have to buy me a whole box or anything, just a one-off little bit before I set up Patreon. And beyond that is the comment section where you can point out all of the things that I missed, ask any further questions about the set, or anything else that I've been up to. So thank you all very much for watching. I'm Edscar, and I always will be.